Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the British Interplanetary's fifth live streaming event or session. I hope we have a trouble-free session tonight and the chipmunks don't act up this time as they did last. For those who don't know me, I'm Alistair Scott, a past president of the Society, and I uh, now just try to coordinate all the activities and events within the Society. So if you've got any good ideas, please let me know and we'll add them into the program. It's a bit of an, an interesting and challenging task in these ever-changing times, so any help uh, would be welcome. If at any time the YouTube link fails, which it's already done, well, it wasn't the YouTube, it was actually the Skype failed this evening, I understand that you should just click on the same URL for the link and join, rejoin the session at more or less the same time and point. I hope you've all had a chance to, to watch the uh, fantastic talk by Stephen Wisdom on Ross Smith's moon suit. Or to give it Stephen's full title, it's reimagining the BIS moon suit for engineer, well, sorry, for construction. I think this title explains a lot. Though I have seen the talk, and uh, I, I reckon we should use the word re-engineering, as that's more or less what happened. I was fortunate in being invited up to the National Space Centre in Leicester for the opening of Britain's space exhibit this time last year. I think it was the 16th of July, and met yeah. Stephen and saw the moon suit there. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank him and Dan and his NSC team for putting up a fantastic display and reminding us all of the role played by the BIS in the very early days of getting Britain into space. So we already have a number of questions, but if you have any more, please email them to me as soon as possible on streaming at bis-space.com. I'm pleased to say we have Stephen with us tonight to answer your questions. So rather than waste any more time, I'm gonna hand over him to him to explain who he is and what it's about, and then I'll get the questions ready. Thanks a lot. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as, uh, as has been said, you know, I am responsible really for the replica, the, the reimagined suit that's over at the uh, National Space Centre at Leicester. Um, and as you will know, if you've, seen the, uh, if you've seen the video on YouTube, you'll know that when that originally came to me, um, I was up against a few other people who were also costume makers. Now, when I say I'm a costume maker, I don't sit there and, you know, twiddle around with bits of lace. I'm very much a kind of hands-on kind of historian type person. Um, so I just said, there's no point in me just making this look vaguely like what uh, we had from the drawings of the 1940s. Let's make something that nods to the past a lot more. So if you've seen the, uh, the film I put together, you'll know that um, we, we looked to see if we could make it in uh, a correct way without obviously making something that would cost an absolute fortune. Um, and yeah, so I've been involved in making things for museums, for television programs with a historical bent, with um, uh, advising on films for about 25, 30 years now. And, and so the history and the making of history um, is, is sort of all encompassing in my life. I think today, the reason I'm sitting in a travel lodge is probably the first time in my life, I'm not doing something on a film to do with history. Um, we live in difficult times, and a lot of my historical performing work and a lot of making work has gone out of the window because simply the people I work for, like English Heritage and the National Trust, aren't doing big events. So at the moment, I'm working on a flooring advert, which is uh, uncharted territory for me. <laughs> so uh, that's, what, uh, that's what I'm doing sitting in a travel lodge at the moment. So that's who I am. And uh, Alistair will be able to tell you a little bit more about um, the suit and about the history behind the real one. And I hope I'll be able to tell you a little bit more about myself and Dan and his team at the uh, National Space Centre, how we reimagined that for display and made something which can stand up to scientific questioning, if not actually the rigours of spaceflight. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. I think it's uh, fantastic that you've managed to get through to us. We had our problems a little while ago and thought it might have been the travel lodge at fault, but I don't believe it was. It was poor Alan and his PC. 
Um, right, I've got some interesting questions here. I'd like the first one I'd like to ask is from Mark Hempsall, who uh, is from Hertfordshire, actually a past Hello. president of the BIS and a fellow. And um, he really puts the whole thing into perspective by asking you and thanking you, first of all, for your really interesting talk and also for the suit, which he found an absorbing and very convincing exhibit when he saw it last year. He was at the opening ceremony with me. Mm. And looking at the exquisite period detail in the suit, I wonder how much you felt you were following engineering solutions Smith and Ross had thought of when they designed the suit and how much you were covering gaps in their original work? It's, it is an excellent question. And, and obviously, um, the, the main thing that all viewers tonight have to take into account is we really don't have that much visual reference for what that suit was going to be like. We have written descriptions, as I'm sure you have, Alistair, in the, um, you know, in the, in the uh, collection down there, the BIS. But really, all Dan and myself, Dan the curator and myself could do is all we could do was nod to um, the original designs, the ones that were left to us um, in the in the late 40s or the even the, uh, you know, even earlier than that. So to cover the, the, the first part of the question, and it, it, did we did we treat it like um, or I suppose to answer the, the first part of the question, we tried to treat it like an engineering problem. We tried to put ourselves in the mindset of Smith and Ross and their team. Um, and a lot of that then, as I say in the lecture, it drew on diving technology very heavily. Um, but more specifically, it drew on aviation technology. So in the style of the suit, in the construction of the suit, we could nod to diving technology, everything that had been developed during the Second World War. But actually, one thing I didn't say in the lecture, I've, I spent a little bit of time at Hendon at the RAF Museum, and I looked at their oxygen equipment on uh, their displays of Royal Air Force flying equipment. And you look at early oxygen equipment, say 1939 into 1940, that very Battle of Britain style equipment. And then you go forward to the end of the war with fitted oxygen masks, with um, uh, composite materials uh, that are being used. Uh, and you look at American technology as well. So in that respect, I was drawing from a lot of technology that was available and that was known. And that is the critical thing. We decided in our sort of pre, what I suppose you would call a pre-production meeting, to, to nod to everything that was known. Where it deviates as I think I explained in the lecture, we tried to cover those gaps by just saying this is um, th this is our interpretation of it. So, for example, with the boots, we kind of knew what we thought they would have been like. But as for covering over the engineering gaps, we, we deliberately tried not to do that because that would be giving a false... Uh, a false reading, as it were, a false impression. And um, and particularly, with, as I explained, I think the shoulders, we made, um, I don't know, actually, I may not have said this actually, but we made an enormously deep rubber convolute for the shoulder um, to give that flexibility of movement. And then Dan and I both, I, I said, I think it would be on the later versions. And Dan said, well, is it on the version we've got the drawing for? And I said, well, no. And he said, then we don't put it in then we do not put it in. And as I think I say, you know, in the lecture online, we we make the decision to remove that. I mean, I spent ages making that mould. I didn't want to destroy it. But, and there was a lot of silicon in it when I moulded it, but we threw it away because it just wasn't, there was no point in doing this if we were not going to do the Mark I, what initially was drawn. And that's why it looks like it does. There are huge errors in that more of which will come out in this. But what's the point of doing it if you're just going to start reimagining it to the extent that it becomes something with all that prior, with all that post knowledge? So, um, I don't know, Alistair, you might have a view on that as well. I, I'm, I'm trying to unmute. Um, well, I don't actually. I expect uh, people like uh, Mark will, but he'll come back to me later. Um, right, I'm going to move around some of the questions because I've got quite a lot coming in now. Oh, um, excellent. I've got Les Shoulder asking now. He he lives on the London-Essex border, still there, another member of the, a fellow of the British Interplanetary Society, and he says Harry Ross in his original paper 
believed a fully functioning suit equipped for a 12-hour moonwalk would weigh in the region of 150 pounds or 68 kilograms earth weight, 25 pounds, 11.5 kilograms lunar weight. What is the weight of the replica in Leicester? And if a fully functioning model could be made, do you think the estimates from 70 years ago stand up? Okay, the weight of the, the fully functioning one. Um, do you know, I, I, I will have to hold up my hand here and say, oh, A, because it isn't fully functioning in that we didn't make a working life support for it. We gave it the, the look of the life support. Um, so I, I can't answer the first part of the question. Um, also, uh, the neck ring is made of fiberglass on that one, purely because to engineer an oval shaped neck ring was an enormously expensive um, task. Now, I can say uh, that the, the suit, the actual, um, the, the, the multiple layers of the suit, so we've got a wool layer, we've got a, a rubber layer, we've got um, the, the top layer, that very quickly became the heaviest part of the suit. And if it's anything like the diving suits that I keep referring to, um, that makes for a very, very heavy suit. Now, I can't say how much our one that we made weighs. I simply can't. Um, apologies for that. Um, what I can say is that I think that that 150 pound estimate Yeah, I think that's probably about right. And I'm, and I'm saying that with a knowledge of diving equipment, of diving suits and all of that, that kind of thing as well. Um, so I would say um, I think it's probably um, about right. An Apollo suit is about 180 pounds Earth weight um, and that's about 30 kilos on the moon. So, yeah, I don't think they're particularly far out. Um, but there was so much, and this will come back later, there was so much in their design that we had to look at and just say, that is just a suggestion. Um, and this will reflect in, a, in, a, um, uh, in things like the helmet design, how the helmet attaches, the, uh, the airlock, the boots, the knees. They have not thought it through. Um, and, and as a result, I can't really say whether when they got to a big problem, whether they wouldn't then say, OK, we well, clearly we just need to really work into that. So I would say based on my knowledge of period diving equipment, they're not that far out. Um, but there is a great deal of difference in that the devil is it truly in the detail on this one. As soon as they got further into the design, I think that design weight would have gone up. Um, not dramatically, but I think it would have gone up. Um, but they can draw on Dural, they can draw on aluminium technology, they can draw on aviation technology and, uh, um, uh, and late war oxygen equipment. And they perhaps could have just started uh, uh, simplifying and, um, add, uh, and, you know, and, and adding weight or uh, removing weight. Um, so, yeah, to answer that question, it's a bit of a non-answer, but I would say I don't think they're that far out. Um, I can't say how much my one fully weighed because it wasn't the oxy the, the backpack wasn't fully operational. Um, but I can think we're just about there on the 150 pounds, I would say. In first question was going to be how much did the Apollo moon suit used by Armstrong and, and Buzz Aldrin actually weigh? And you yeah, said 80, 80 kilograms? It's, it's, it's about 180 pounds. So I think 100, that's uh, okay. 180 pounds. So I think that's about 30 kilograms uh, yeah. moon weight, I think. Um, no, hang on. No. So it's um, yeah, 180 pounds um, on the uh, on Earth. I thought it was more than that, but I did do a quick check of this because obviously I'm interested in the Apollo thing as well. Um, but I do know that obviously if the if the um, I know on Apollo, for example, the, the astronauts on Earth couldn't get in a functional lunar rover with the weight of their um, PLSS and their A7L suits because that would have buckled the, the, the spine of the lunar rover. So I think and this is often cited by you know, lunar conspiracists when they see the, the astronauts driving around in a, in a fully functioning um, 
uh, a moon buggy and they say oh obviously that that's how they filmed it well obviously that is something that they can test bed the driving of it on earth um so i you know those suits were as we all know obviously the moon reduces the, the weight of things because of the lunar gravity um so i would you know i would probably say that i think we're not too far out um and it's comparable with the apollo suit but i think it would have got heavier is my opinion that wasn't much of an answer. I do apologise. Well, it was it was getting there. Um, right, I've got another question from uh, Les Shoulder, and he asks, in his paper, Harry Ross said that his first thoughts on composition of the la laminated layers of the suit were to use aluminium foil as one of the insulating layers, but he felt that the noise created by the movement of the wearer might be too distracting, so left it out. Would a cloth rubber foil arrangement have been an improvement? Foil breaks. That's one thing I will say about it. Foil breaks. Foil is heavy. If you think how much um, uh, even a very fine roll of cooking foil weighs, and then you consider that you have to cover the surface area of a man plus the additional side, uh, the additional um, uh, uh, volume of, this, of a surface vol surface area because that suit's not skin tight that's there's a lot of that suit up here on the chest um yes you could use that um would it help no the suit would then become considerably heavier um it would even sandwiched in a glue layer between the rubber uh, is that going to help the situation no aluminium paint on the surface not a bad idea. Um, I, as always with spaceflight and aviation, it is a trade-off, and particularly with spaceflight, as NASA are discovering on all of these missions, particularly Artemis and um, and beyond to the Moon and Mars. Uh, it is all down. Yes, you could shield a spacecraft from solar solar radiation, but you would end up making that so um, unwieldy on Earth when it tries to take off. I know you know it doesn't matter in space, but on the takeoff weight, that's the point at which everything counts, you know, simplify and add lightness, as Colin Chapman said when he was building the Lotus racing cars. And, and the same thing applies, you know, simplify and add lightness. And I think the same thing goes with aircraft and spaceflight. I don't think it's going to achieve anything, putting the aluminium in there. Ultimately, I think they would have been better off staying with al um, uh, fine aluminium paint on the surface or an aluminium coating paint or not going down that route at all. Mm -hmm. However, I am not a scientist, and there may be a very, very good scientific reason why that would have counted. But um, from a purely weight and and uh, um, uh, and uh, functional point of view, I would say I'm not sure that's going to help. No, no. Right. Well, thank you for that one. And I've got another one from Les. I'm going to do them all in the same uh, uh, t time. The, hel <laughs> the helmet seems to fit very flush to the neck piece. How are the nuts attached to the bolts, as there appears to be little room to manoeuvre, especially at the rear? Even with two people helping each other to suit up, I still can't see it working. Yeah, absolutely. I absolutely agree. And we had a long conversation about attaching the helmet to the neck ring. Um, in the end, what we opted for, um, and again, we didn't, we, you know, we, we, um, we talked about this, we drew it, we designed it, we showed it to the engineer, and he kind of did that kind of, really? Kind of way like that, because what we considered was a system whereby, and okay, let me paint the problem, uh, which, which you've, you've summed up very, very well there. Helmet goes on, and now you've got a system whereby that helmet needs to pull down and lock um, on an airtight seal all around that neck ring. So let's assume that neck ring is machined and milled in, in perfectly flat aluminium with no warping in it at all. So it would have to have, we think, some kind of hard upper torso beneath it to give it a sound um, seating. Uh, and then the helmet needs to go on. Now, obviously, on a, on a diving helmet, on a um, 
on an Apollo helmet, it goes on, and it's uh, on the uh, Apollo bubble helmet, it goes on at an angle, and then it turns, and that interrupted screw thread pulls it down, and then you have on the uh, the bubble helmet, the Apollo bubble helmet, you have a locking system that pulls everything together. On a diving helmet, on a, a, a diving helmet like is seen by me in the me wearing in the in the film. You put that on, interrupted thread, and as you pull it through, again, it pulls it down to an, a leather seal or a rubber seal on the neck ring, which have all been beautifully engineered. You can't do that with an oval neck ring. So now we have a problem where what you had to do was put the helmet on and then pull it down. So what we considered was a system whereby on the back of the neck ring was, um, and I drew all of this, an internal system whereby the, the the, the helmet, the outside of the helmet is kind of here, if you will, and we're on the, this is, astronaut's head is here. So the, there's the outside of the helmet, but there is a small um, system of flange inside, whereby when the helmet goes on, you kind of lock the helmet at the back. So you put it on first, so it's now locked, and as you pull it down, as, as it does so, it goes against, you're putting more pressure on the seal in the base of the helmet. Now you need to pull that down at the front, but you can't get, as you would with a diving, the, the corselet on a diving suit, the bronze sort of collar here, which has protruding bolts going through and a tool that the, the fitters who dress you, that they need to you know, bolt you down. So we considered a system whereby the helmet pulled down and then you withdrew your arms into the suit again and you used internal hook locks, um, a bit like you get on... Um, like a hook that when you pull it down, it springs against itself, and then you can do it up from the inside with with um, with finger tight, uh, you know, tight tightening bolts. So it almost hooks down the internal flange on the helmet and pulls everything down against the internal rubber seal uh, that we considered would be have to be built in the inside of the helmet. And in that respect, to refer to the earlier question, that has never been thought about in the original design. That was purely myself and uh, a bit of input from Dan, the curator at the museum, considering how it could be done and how a, 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 an airtight seal could be made. Um, maybe we could have pumped up that seal with an internal uh, pump system. I think the Mercury helmet had a pump up seal, that black ring all around the visor on the Mercury helmet. That is a pump up seal that in the event of a depressurization of the capsule, that seal would inflate and and um and give a, a completely airtight seal to the to the faceplate to the inside of the visor so maybe we could have gone down that route with a pneumatic uh seal that, that pumped up to to high pressure which which united the whole thing but in that respect we are in fantasy engineering territory because i suppose this does refer back to the to the earlier question are we filling in the gaps yes we are um are we walking in the shoes of Smith and Ross? Well, yes, we think we would have been if they had taken this any further because people cleverer than I would have sat there and said, you're going to have a problem here, Mr. Smith, Mr. Ross. And this is how we think it could be solved. So in that respect, Dan and I were the backroom boys, at, you mm -hmm. know, Brooklands and things like that. And, you know, we could have been in the, the you know, the, the, the pressure testing sheds at Brooklands and at Weybridge testing this stuff out into the 50s, you know, and I feel that we were in that respect walking in their shoes, but with very much a nod to the technology that that they would have known. And, you know, when I refer you to the, the Mercury suit, what's that, 1961, but it's developed from um, the uh, Navy Mark IV. And that was very much a mid 50s design or late 50s design. So that technology of pressurized air, pneumatic seals is beginning to exist. I don't think it's that much of a jump to say we could have gone down that route. Fascinating. Right. Um, I've got another question. I think this one has come from, yes, Griff Ingram. And uh, he'd like to, well, it's, it's, it's more of a statement and a question combined. He says there's a persistent rumor which he shall have to look into because he does a lot of the research for us. Uh, and it, it's that the BIS investigated the use of a liquid cooled undergarment for the moon suit. Do you think that this would have been practical at the time? Um, now, 
Certainly for cooling, or for heating garments, this is a known technology. Um, so suits with things woven through them. Um, the Americans are flying in heated suits um, in the end of the Second World War. Um, the British are flying in heat. Uh, Lancaster uh, gun, gun crews, uh, gun position crews are flying in heated suits. Is it that much of a, 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 a jump of technology to say, let's replace those heating elements with, with rubber tubing? No. Can we get rubber tubing at that point, which is going to not perish? Yeah, I think they've got, I think, well, now they would use silicon Tigon tubing, I think is what they used on the Apollo um, flights. Um, is rubber going to be sufficiently, uh, artificial rubber going to be sufficiently flexible and thermally, trans uh, with enough thermal transfer in, in that period um, to be able to take heat away? That needs looking into. Um, did they draw the idea for a suit? Yes, they did. Um, uh, the BIS, and yes, I think um, you know they they did have that idea. I recall on the um, cutaway, the, the Smith cutaway. Um, I recall that saying that it was just a woolen lining, and we had a, a really nice set of uh, like a woolen undergarment, like a set of combinations, if you will. Um, and I am the only person who wore the suit wearing all of that and nearly perished if heat exhaustion. There is a series of photographs, which is annoying me at the moment, I can't find, which my colleague took for me in his studio. And it is of me trying to wriggle into the suit. And it is the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen we can't put the i'm lying on the floor i'm pulling the suit around me i'm wriggling in i'm getting my feet into the legs could they have done it with a with a, a garment on i'm not sure i i just don't believe that rubber tubing and cooling equipment and things like that would have been um sufficiently advanced in its flexibility to have worked at that period. But again, as we move forward, you know, the 50s is an incredible time of development. Um, I deal a lot with latex rubber um, in my molding and casting. Um, there is a good reason why latex has now been over uh, uh, superseded by other technical materials. And in the late 40s, I don't think there are that, there's that much super flexible rubber to make a suit which you would be capable of sitting on falling on and, and moving easily in so let's go back to that thing i mentioned a lot mobility let's look into it that's all i can say let's look into it well there there were all also rumors that nasa actually pinched the design to use for the cooling system on the uh, apollo 11 suits so uh, I, I will we'll have to investigate that that one as well um Right, another one from Griff. He says an article in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society later in the 1950s proposed a suit to be donned in two halves with a waist ring connecting between the top and the bottom halves. In your opinion, would this have been more practical? Absolutely. I, absolutely. Um, it, as I said, just said, it is... I think they would have, they never made the suit. They never made even a mock-up of it. But I think somebody would have looked at those drawings just like we did, myself and Dan, and just said, that doesn't work. That just does not work. All of those questions that I was asking, they would have asked, and very quickly they would have said, this isn't going to work. Um, so is two part, do two parts work better? Yes, they do. Um, I think it's Henschel, the German aviation company in the Second War. They make a pressurised suit for use in one of their aircraft. And it's all steel joints, but I think the Henschel suit has got a join at the waist as well. Um, very, very much like uh, the new Artemis suits do. Um, the EMU that's used uh, was used on shuttle and is used on um, uh, ISS at the moment. It just makes sense to, to put that garment on in two pieces. And once you've done that, you get away with all of the problems of uh, neck entry. You get a, you can now fix a helmet onto the neck and bolt that down permanently. So you're now putting it on with the helmet already in place, which I think is the same as the Orland suit, I believe, has got a, a fixed helmet. So you get into that position where um, 
now you have given yourself so many more options. And um, I was just trying to remember. Oh, yes, there we go. It's come back to me. A few days ago, one of my diving friends put up a picture of a Royal Navy diver operating in um, post-war, and he is clearing mines in the harbour at Hartlepool, aerial mines dropped by the bomb, uh, dropped by the Germans, the, you know, things that have fallen, torpedoes that have fallen out of ships. It's harbour clearance diving equipment. So it's all made of non-conductive materials, so no steel, no materials there. But critically, it's got its own backpack. It's a, I, I must send, actually, Alistair, I must send you a picture of this. So it's got its own air system, so it's not having air pumped to it like my diving suit is. What it has also got is a helmet with a couple of pipes going into the back, flexible um, uh, fibre and rubber pipes. But here's the bit. It's got a central two-piece suit. So you don the top half and the bottom half and you join them together with a large um, collar, the spigot and collar joint that joins together. And then that is uh, basically uh, clamped across. And that was done purely for access reasons. So have they learned? Yes. Is that the sort of technology that Smith and Ross would have been able to see? Yes. And it's called an, uh, a mine clearance suit. Um, and I will send you, Alistair, a picture of that and you will be able to, to see the, the reference I refer to. I only saw that a couple of weeks ago at the most. And one question on that, does the actual central, the, the waist ring rotate so that you've got movement on the top half? Yeah, well, that's, again, because I was looking at the young lady from Na uh, at NASA wearing the new Artemis suit, and she's got that full, right. flexible, um, incredible mobility. Mm. And no, it doesn't. But what they are doing on the uh, mine clearance suit, they're relying on the flex of the suit. So the ring is fixed, but they are relying on the fact that your, your, your legs and your, your, I think you can turn at the waist, but you don't turn that much at the waist. But your shoulders are obviously going to turn a lot more and your, back, your upper torso is going to twist. So they're relying on the movement of the suit and the flexibility of the suit, which is still quite open, to mm -hmm. be able to turn from side to side. Um, does that work when you're wearing uh, thicker layers? Um, no. Could they have machined... Um, uh, bearings, uh, the, you know, like a bearing suit, like the um, the the, the, the uh, Artemis suit. Yes, uh, could they have made pressure-proof uh, ball racing seals? Yes, because that's what the Henschel suit is like. So that's got the same system. And once again, you know, the Germans are, have got the drop on us on some elements of, of military engineering. Not all. Everybody thinks the Germans are superb engineers, but actually, very often in the Second War, they made they over-engineered things. Um, and actually, you, you know, the Henschel suit to a certain extent is, is over-engineered as well. But they would have been able to look at this kind of ball race technology and go, yeah, we can make that bigger. And if we can make some kind of seal within that. So in, in that respect, yeah, I, I think that that is very much a way forward in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And they could have looked at that and said, yeah. And, and as I say, critically, that is the Pandora's box, because once you can get once you can open that technology you can then have a fixed helmet so you put it on with the helmet in place you no longer need to worry about air loss there you can have fixed gloves and now it's a lot easier to put on again as we see on iss that whole rig is just mounted and you can wriggle into the legs mm -hmm. and then you can wriggle into the top and then put the whole thing together and then free yourself from the rig that's been holding it and now you're ready to to walk um uh, to spacewalk, and and I think that is the once you open that technology, you've you've made a um, you've made your, your life considerably easier. Well, you you've said it's simple, but Griff's next question is: Was it going to be simple for them? Because he says in the moonship design study, the airlock was beneath the deck of the cabin, between the cabin floor and the solid rocket motors, presumably still at uh, suit stowage would have been there too. How would you rate the practicality of donning the suit in such a tight space, presumably with the help of another astronaut wearing an identical suit? Uh, yeah, and here we go. Virtually impossible for the suit that I made. Virtually impossible. <laughs> that is, you know, uh, um, with a two-piece suit, with, with all kinds of other technology available, with by, by drawing that line forward a little bit more, absolutely. Um, with the suit I made, what we, what, you know, I nicknamed the Mark One, absolutely impossible. I wriggled into that, um, and my colleague who photographed me on the day 
you know, as I say, we've got photographs of me lying on my side. My arms are like this. I'm trying to pull myself in. I, lunar gravity is not going to help you. You are going to be stuck. You are not going to be able to get into it. And that is, again, as we say, that is why that suit that is in Leicester, that would never have flown to the moon. Not in, not in a millennia would they have made the decision to take that to the moon. They would have looked at that and said, the Mark I doesn't work. Let us work into that. Let us look at this and let us let us see all of these problems, which are legion, the problems there are with that suit, and let us solve those one by one until we have got something which we think will work. And then I then think you've got something that is more usable. And as I said earlier, that I think that the key of that is waste entry. Two mm. parts. Yeah, yeah. Hard up at all, so, and hard you know, like that. We'll have to let the experts do it because the Artemis suits look as if they've got the answer. And actually, some of the suits now being worn by uh, uh, SpaceX and the teams going up on that uh, really look. Yeah, and, and, and interestingly, those you know externally designed by a, a, a film costume designer, um, yeah. Jose Fernandez, who designed those suits, did a, you know, an amazing job of making them look actually awful, to be quite honest. <laughs> um, quite a few of my friends were saying, oh, you're joking. People aren't going to wear that in space. And, and But actually, they're not walking in space in those suits. Yeah. It's purely a pressure garment that's been styled. Yeah. But, you know, whatever you think about Elon Musk, um, the man has a certain degree of media awareness so he has made something which looks futuristic um, yes. and you only have to look inside the capsule to see that the 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 capsule is not a traditional flick button spacecraft it's yeah. it looks like you know looks like an That's apple like, store yeah <laughs> yeah now i've got several other questions just coming in and uh one is from um uh, this one's actually from al marlow himself in in good old milton Keynes. Um, right. Hi, Stephen. Would the BIS moon suit have used a standard air atmosphere, i.e. oxygen and nitrogen, or was there any discussion at that time of using a pure oxygen atmosphere? Well, again, I need to check this because I originally thought that was running purely on oxygen, and I still maintain that that is running on oxygen. Um, the curator said that he said it was running an air mix. Now, as we had said in the, the film, you run an air mix in that suit, you're not going anywhere. 14.7 pounds per square inch, that suit is going to be, um, if you run a traditional air mix, I should say, um, that suit is going to be so immobile due to inflation that you're you're not going to be able to, to move at all. Um, it makes sense to run that on an oxygen mix. We are good at oxygen technology at this period, don't forget. We have been running high altitude oxygen equipment in Lancaster bombers and, and various other high altitude aircraft, um, B-17s and things like that during the Second World War. So close fitting oxygen equipment is something we know about. Can we get an oxygen delivery system working well? Yes. Um, are they going to go down that route again? I think it would have made sense. And I recall in reading in our notes that we wrote together, Dan and myself at the museum, that they talk about a pure oxygen mix. Um, that is something we need to check. And that is something that the BIS undoubtedly have got the original documents and maybe they could look into that. Um, and uh, we could look at that, Alan. But I'm, I am of the belief that that is a pure oxygen environment. Yeah. Well, we'll have to get uh, Griff back in action to, uh, to have a look at that for us. Um, right, I've got one from Ange here, who actually, I think we've probably answered this one as well. Um, he, I've watched the presentation and enjoyed it. Just a comment rather than the question. Apollo EVA and moon suits were made of two pieces, a bottom half and a top half. So they could get into the leg part first and then be helped into the torso and arms part. Um, I think we've come to that conclusion that actually yeah, that is the best way to go. Yeah, just just remember though that the uh, the Apollo suit is is actually a one piece garment. Don't forget. Um, so if we met, if we're talking about the Apollo EM, uh, the Apollo uh, A seven L and the A seven L B, which were worn on Apollo up to eleven to seventeen, that is still a one piece garment. Um, Neil Armstrong and and Co. They get into those suits through the rear, so there is a zip on the Apollo suit running from the neck ring 
all the way up to effectively your belly button, a, a zip that goes all the way around the suit. And when you see, um, if you watch the Michael Burke um, film from 1969 of Burke getting into one, he gets into it from the rear, um, and one of the replicas I made exactly the same. You get into it through the rear, you duck your head under the, the zip, and you come out through the neck ring. Um, that was not available to, that, that thought was not available to our men, um, which is a shame because it would have worked, and they could have done a zip in the rear. Um, we could have done that, but it, would have sold, it, wouldn't have, um, it wouldn't have been what they had conceived. So... Um, yeah, so the modern ISS and EMU, uh, the ISS EMU suit, the ones for going outside the ISS, they are two piece. Artemis, two piece. Apollo suits, one piece. Mm. Um, and all the others. Um, yeah, so as I say, I think we've covered that a little bit, but yeah, that, that is the yeah. thing to remember. Would, would you say that your uh, the suit, and this is another question Anne just sort of shaped, would you say that the suit had to be made for a, a person? It couldn't be one size fits all yeah the, you know that's that was the big thing wasn't it in, in the apollo missions that they had to make suits to fit the person mm. um and i think is it the uh the sohol suit the russian suit that's completely size adaptable i believe and it's got sort of zip up uh, uh buckles in the arms that can make the arms shorter and longer and so on and so forth um Yeah, I think they probably would have made, I mean, if it's, it, a lot of it comes down to that body length thing I mentioned before. What you don't want is to have lots of material hanging underneath your crotch because it's going to stop you walking around. It's going to, everything needs to fit tight. Remember also, once you start putting air inside, or oxygen rather, inside that rubber bag effectively and bobbing around on the moon, if you've got extra space not filled by astronaut, that's just going to be inflated space and that's going to make that suit less mobile. So I think, again, we're drawing a bit of a line based on what we know about the mobility of that suit and how it would have worked. But I think they would have said, this is Flight Lieutenant XYZ who is going on our moonshot. He is five foot eight. We are going to make this suit fit him. Well, I shan't go. I used to be six foot three. Um, Right, I've got got an interesting one here from uh, Stephen. Yes, it's Steve Salmon here, uh, another fellow and a member of the uh, society. Uh, congratulations, Stephen, on a brilliant project, an excellent video about its construction. You've really helped to capture some of the uh, prestigious history of the BIS and in 3D. Thank you. Lovely to know. Thank you yeah. very much. What a lovely thing to say. He hasn't got to Leicester yet, but I think he's going to. Um, and so I'm particularly looking forward to doing that as soon as he can. can. Uh, all the very best for tonight's Q&A. And he hasn't actually asked a question yet, but there may be one coming in later. So right. I'll, I'll leave that one. But I've got another question here for you. In fact, I've got one myself, which I, I was ha hanging on till, till later to see who else might have something to say. Let me just get this one up and running first of all. This one here I've got from, oh, Terry Regan. Let's see what he's got to say. Terry actually makes models as well. In fact, okay. we make some, make some of our most fantastic spacecraft models. Um, so uh, Daedalus, the last one he made, is actually on show at the BIS. Terry, uh, my, uh, my, fa my father built the Orion for 2001, by the way. So uh, ah. my, my father was the model maker who built the Orion for that as well. So uh, it's now, uh, That was quite large, wasn't it? About sort of 10 feet long? No, it's about five feet long. Um, mm. Obviously, the models were all destroyed after the film was made. Um, but when my dad was in his 20s, uh, there is a photograph we've got at home. But in the way of my father, Stanley Kubrick said, to everybody on set. I don't want any photographs of the models coming out. And even though dad has a photograph of him chiseling away on the Orion, which he made entirely by himself on those. Mm -hmm. that, un unlike today where on a film set, you know, you have a team of 20 all doing different things. My father just got the job and built the model. So that's that's what he did. Um, and there he is making the Orion. And I say, can I put it online? And dad goes, no. Stanley <laughs> Kubrick said, no, we don't want photographs. We, we, we promised we wouldn't uh, advertise these pictures. So, yes, um, yeah, this, my is father, where, my built Orion. this is where your skills came from then, obviously. Uh, yeah. um, right. He's saying very interesting video and also the way you tackled making the suit. My question is with the glues used at the time, what's the chance 
of getting the glues failing on the moon's surface? Yeah, absolutely. Um, really good question. And I, I like good technical questions. Um, <laughs> you're looking at a, a contact adhesive for other, well, sorry, let's start again. Let's refer back to, to diving suits again. You are looking at um, contact adhesive which is uh, you know, very strong, it's, uh, but the trouble with gluing, okay, the trouble with gluing rubber is you need to get a really good bond, you need to soften that rubber. All glues that work really well work by softening the surface. Um, so if you think about, say, like polystyrene cement and things like that, they melt the surface and bond the two together. Um, so adhesive that when when you have a diving suit and the seam gets a, a rubber strip an inch wide rubber strip of latex put over it you need there to kind of bond that latex to the suit and that's done with contact adhesive now generally it works pretty well but in the the, the lecture uh, that i did online when i'm holding up that cuff of that diving suit you see that that well maybe you didn't but the whole suit is delaminating the glue is failing so Contact adhesive, which works by sitting on a surface, on the surface of the rubber, that generally fails after, in normal temperature. That generally fails after a certain amount of time because all it's doing is kind of sitting on the surface. And when it starts to lose its stiction, its, its, its power, it then just pops away. So would they have had to have done new glue technologies? Well, yes, but then once again we are drawing that line into uncharted territory would that glue have failed on the surface of the moon in temperatures what's the greatest thermal range of anything in the solar system i believe of something like 400 degrees of you go from 200 degrees in the um, sunlight to minus 130 or something in a shadow is that going to mess around and start freezing surfaces, start making glues unset? Yes, I think it probably will. So that is an excellent question. And I think the moon is trying to kill you at every millisecond you walk on the surface. So is that going to freeze the glue? Is it going to fail the glue? Yes, it is. Um, is that going to create all kinds of problems for latex rubber or rubber seals? Yes, it is. Um, and that is why Apollo invent new materials, I believe, in that incredible nine year period between 1961 and 1969. Uh, they invent, I think, what was it one of the heads of NASA says, you know, we've got technology which hasn't even yet been invented that we need to, to, to create. And that is why, you know, 400,000 people work away on technology which is simply just not there when Kennedy stands up at Rice University and it is there when Armstrong walks on the moon. So, is that going to be the same? Um, the process yeah i think it is um and i think people would have quickly realized that in super freezing technology um of you know super freezing um wind tunnels and things like that that glue would have failed yeah right okay well we've got some more questions coming in um right i've got one i must apologize to patrick Mann because um his first email went into my junk tray which uh is rather unfortunate, but he sent it again. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Patrick. Um, right, here is the question. Uh, thank you for a fascinating lecture. Given all the historical research you've done in the process of creating this amazing replica of Ross and Smith's lunar spacesuit, what do you think is the most impressive element of their design? And which element do you think could have been most improved? While sticking oh, right. to contemporary materials and technologies, now that's that's, that's a whole a whole right. new video by the sound of it. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll deal with the second part first. What could have been improved? Um, the the thin gloves, um, as you see in that that scene where I get stuck in the suit, that our whole idea of thin gloves um, with no um, uh, with with no real thought gone into the extraction of your hand now i have a friend who's just left the military and he wears as part of his work he wears nbc suits all the time and he said to me when i had that problem he was laughing at the film and he said when we put our nbc suits on we which have got fixed gloves already in them he says same problem he says we have to put thin cotton gloves on and in fact i think he might even have sent me some thin cotton gloves and he said i think they would have worn these inside those now 
going back to what we said about that Henschel pressure suits, the suit, the um, the the, uh, the the BF Goodrich suit, the one at the Tomato Worm suit, all of those have rubber seals on them. Can we make a rubber seal suit? Can we make gloves that can be clipped on? Yes, we can. So to answer the second part first, biggest problem, the inability when you've got that suit on to take that off easily. And a lot of that came down, particularly, as I say, with, with me, to that problem of not being able to withdraw your big sweaty hand from that glove. So that's problem number one. Um, what really you know, worked for me on it. Um, I think that I'm just thinking about that because there were several elements that I looked at that I thought that's that's really clever. Um, the silvering on the helmets, I think that and the, the, the to reduce solar radiation, that's clearly something they thought about uh, to, to reduce it. Uh, the, the black on the chest to to so if you want to warm up, you simply turn towards the sun, pull the sun cape back, and let that solar radiation warm you up. That. That's something where they, they had a real understanding of the physics behind that. And I I'll, I will take my hat off to them and say, you applied physics to a problem and in a, in a pure physics kind of way. And I like that and I admire that. Um, and you let science solve, the, in a, you purely let science solve a problem of heat loss and heat gain. And I think that's really impressive. Um, what else would have worked? Um, Oh, the shooting stick that he's sitting on. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. This is quite a sensible idea, isn't it? When you're tired on the moon, you simply get your shooting stick out and you sit there. Um, that wasn't a bad idea. Where he was carrying that when he was wandering about with it, I don't know, because he can't put it on his backpack. Um, I guess he could have just hooked it on his chest um, or just carried it like uh, an Alpine stock climbing up the Eiger, I guess. So I, yeah. I, I, there's lots that doesn't work. There's a few things like the physics, the physics of the the warming and the cooling, that does work. And and I that's my kind of real admiration for the men there. And the fact they're doing it on a shoestring budget, and they're just letting ideas flow in that. I think it was all done in a house in Chingford, wasn't it? Um, it was designed in a where they came from, Alistair. They were both. In, uh, I believe so, but I wasn't around at the time. No, no, no. <laughs> Massive admiration for you know from Chingford to the stars. I think I was in. I think I was in Bangkok at that time. Um, right, quick one here. Um, pure oxygen. Ah, Griff has got the answer as to what they were breathing. He's looked it up. Obviously, pure oxygen at one sixty millimeters pressure. That's interesting. I'm not now. What? Did, so one sixty yeah. millimeters pressure. What's that psi? What does that come down to there? Uh, Anybody? No, we have. We'll have to ask Griff to do us a calculation on that one. Because I think the Apollo suits are running their their PS their, their um, P, um, pounds per square inch. They're coming in at about three point seven five to four psi. I think somebody, I think somebody looked into that. So I'd be interested to know if there is um, if that technology has has come forward to Apollo and if they've they've worked that out as well. That that is interesting. I'm not a mathematician, so someone can do the. Uh, <laughs> we'll we'll get the, we'll the get the experts onto that one. Right, I've got another one just come in from Alex Wood. Uh, oh, this this is quite an interesting one. You may not want to answer it. Uh, when you were trapped in the suit, how long did it take you to eventually get out? And how did you think the design would have been modified at the time to make it easier? Okay, about 45 minutes uh, <laughs> to get out. Uh, I was ser I live in a very, very quiet little street in Norfolk uh, where there's only four houses there. And I very, very seriously considered it was half 11. Um, and I very seriously considered hobbling out of the door uh, with my body half out of the suit and knocking on um, my neighbor's door. Uh, and, um, and at which point Gary and Craig would have come to the door. Or Gary would have come to the door and go, what, what earth is going on? And I would have said, can you hold my hand and just help me pull my hand? Out? And that was absolutely on my um, on my list of things to do because I was stuck. I had not got any notion. Obviously, I was, you know, with a nod to good camera and good copy, I uh, got my phone out and made a little film. Um, and I did shoot an entire kind of video diary of the whole process, actually, um, of photographs and things like that. Um, 
what could they have done? As I said earlier, have gloves that come off. Um, that isn't impossible to do. I mean, if you look again, look at a, a Navy Mark IV, which becomes the Mercury suit, that has plug-in O-seal ring, like a, a, a system where you can plug that in, give it a quick turn. And then what they did on the Navy Mark IV, where you could actually make an additional um, pressure seal with this zipped cuff that went over the top of the whole thing. And, it, you know, they can make zips that are virtually airtight. Um, if you think today on a, on a dry suit, a dry diving suit, they're watertight. So they can make zips that are airtight even then. Um, I would, it, it, a lot of it comes to me on, as we said earlier, make that waist break in two and make those gloves able to come off and then make it light enough that those men can wear that back in the capsule and talk to each other in the capsule, then um, if necessary, clip their helmets on, or if the helmet's already fixed, make some way that they can talk to each other through a radio link, put their gloves on, put their back, clip their backpacks on, and then go out onto the surface of the moon. Don't yeah. ever think that it's, don't ever think that it's close to what they could have worn on the moon, because it is miles off, and I keep making that point. Well, when you were stuck in that suit, I would have used the phone to ring a friend. <laughs> I don't think I would have. I got caught in my ferret once, uh, the bottom of that. And, uh, that was nasty enough. Um, yeah. Right. He goes on to say, how much heat would have leaked in or out through the metal pins that separated the cape from the suit? Brilliant. Good, good science-based question. So to understand the metal mushrooms on the suit, as we said before, those... Those are to um, create a, a vacuum standoff gap between the sun cape and the, the suit itself. But of course, the pins themselves are going to thermally transfer material. Um, do you know that it's never really occurred? That is an excellent question. And it's never really occurred to me. Obviously, everything is going to transfer heat or or or, 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 or um, cool in its own particular way um i can't say how much because i just don't have that information available can we thermally um insulate the 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 bedding of those pins into the hard upper torso yes we can um can we have a uh, a thermal barrier a, a, some kind of insulator, be it asbestos or something like that, in a ring around the base of that mushroom, so we have no bridge of tra uh, transferable bridge of heat or or, or, or um, cooling across that. Yes, we can. Um, would that have been something that would have occurred to them? Let's hope so. Should you have been on the design body? Yes, you should, because that is an excellent question. That is, and I think. That is exactly the kind of questions that after the Mark I and the Mark II had been made, that somebody, much like yourself there, would have said, that isn't going to work. We're going to lose heat through that. And I, that's why I think that's an excellent question with a real nod to the understanding of the problems that they would have encountered. You can, you, you, you've can, you got the job. You're on the team. Yeah, I would have used plastic and, and made sure that the uh, temperature didn't move through that. Um, right, he goes on to ask one last bit here. What influence did the BIS suit have, if any, on NASA's designs? Mm. NASA will say nothing, won't they? Because um, if, you, if you go back and look at the development of the NASA suit, um, there is no comparison, really, between Mercury um, then, then let's move forward to Gemini and we look at the suit used in Gemini and we're beginning to move slightly more toward the Apollo look. Um, if you look at what Gris and White and Chaffee are wearing the days they died, uh, the day they died on, on uh, the Apollo 1 fire in 67, their suits effectively look like Gemini suits that are with additional um, covers to them. Um, on the helmets and things like that. That would have not worked um, on the moon. Um, when ILC and uh, trying to remember the um, other people, um, uh, 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 Hamilton Standard made the Apollo suits, they 
they had 20 years more understanding of the problems that you would encounter on the moon. And they were inventing materials. Is it 14 different layers in an Apollo suit? Something like that. They've got mylar. They've got nylon. Um, they've got, I think we have nylon during the war, actually. But they've certainly got mylar, which wasn't invented. They've got foils, which weren't invented. Um, they have got technical materials. They've got beta fabric, um, which is unburnable material. So can you draw that parallel? I don't think you really can. I think that... I think what Smith and Ross are doing is they are saying, here are a certain number of problems which we will encounter on our voyage to the moon. How can we solve those problems? And I think with the BIS suit in its current form, the form we see it in the museum, I think they scratch the surface of answering those questions. If you look at the Apollo suit, that answers a lot more of them but in fairness that wasn't you know it was designed by a series of brilliant people um and not in a you know domestic house in chingford where east you know east london by two brilliant scientists um hell it's very easy just to draw something ultimately it does it all comes down to that it's really easy to draw something it's much more difficult to make that thing um and I think what I did, what Dan, the curator, helped me with, we we answered only a fraction of those questions. And tonight we've had some amazing further questions highlighting some more of those problems. Um, I think Apollo was solving, or with the Apollo suit, they were being faced with those problems every single day. And even, you know, as, as um, Harrison Schmidt and um, Gene Cernan said on Apollo 17, that they were having leak, they were leaking air, uh, oxygen on their suits through their cuffs and their neck rings, particularly through their cuffs and their arm rings, um, because they were handling lunar soil so much. And um, lunar soil is very gritty and very um, uh, all pervasive, and it was getting into those seals. So Artemis, they're trying to cover all of those joints just to stop the ingress of lunar soil. So I think Apollo. Well, it worked um, and it worked really well. Um, and even then it still had its own fair share of problems. Did Apollo nod to the BIS? I don't think so. No. I, I really don't. I have to say, I really don't. Well, we'll, have to, say yes, but... we'll have to set Griff up on it because someone says there's a letter somewhere thanking us for our participation in the program. Um, I'm not sure how much detail it goes into. But didn't we have, I mean, but this is the point, though. I think on the night that Armstrong and Aldrin walk on the moon, isn't there, there's a, there's a, certainly a mission specialist who's British. There are a lot of British people oh, yes. in that room. Um, and, and I think that's what the exhibition at Leicester highlights. It's got all of those names on the wall of people who have contributed towards mm. that. And um, it, it is very much more international than the Americans would ever have you believe. Um, I think, Alistair, on the night when we met, you said that the leg on the, 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 the lander, the BIS lander, that's very, very similar to the folding leg on, on uh, the eagle. And, you know, and I absolutely agree with you. But, you know, if you've got a certain problem, you're going to solve it in a certain way. There's no yeah. point in trying to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. And, and if that's going to work, you know, they knew how to make folding legs. We'd done it on Hanley Page Halifaxes and Lancasters and Wellingtons and various other aircraft. And we were really good at it. So, yeah, I don't think I, I think you can credit Apollo with a great with a great amount, basically. OK, now I've got Griff has come back. Brilliant. He's done the done the sums and he works out that actually the PSI uh, is three point zero nine three eight eight. Good work, so, Griff. That's three, but we're, three, but we're in the threes. Three so, psi, yeah. Yeah, so Apollo is, I think, 3.75 psi right. um, on the pressure in the suit, and I'll have to check that. But we're in the same ballpark. We're between yeah. three and four, and I think that gives you that mobility. Any more than that, and you lose that mobility any less, and you pass out. So yes, makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, I think that's probably... Sorry, we've, uh, we've got one last question. Uh, have I got you there? We got yes, one last I, question. I, I'm still here. Right. 
Good. Well, we'll finish off with my question, which I was saving uh, till last. And that is, I was very interested to see what you said, that the, the suit was designed so that the astronaut could bring moon samples into his suit through the airlock on his chest for closer examination. How would he avoid cross-contamination and where did they put the samples afterwards? Yep. Once again, not answered. Um, we, if we take that cutaway view as gospel design, uh, as, as our main design drawing, it's just not answered, is it? No. Now, there is enough room in that chest once you've withdrawn your arms. And, and let's assume you've got some kind of lighting inside. Now, um, I, don't want to, I don't want to turn a filament bulb on in a pure oxygen atmosphere. You know, um, but let's assume that he has some form of lighting inside. Mm. Um, he withdraws his arms, he opens the airlock, he takes his sample out. He can examine that sample by looking down the, the long front of the helmet. He can examine that up uh, wherever. He, again, we're in fantasy space flight here. He, uh, has he got some kind of little tool rail around the front? Has he got a series of pockets around the inside chest of the suit to, to either side of the airlock that he can put his lunar samples in. It's a great idea. Brilliant. You could, astronaut can look at things. Brilliant idea. Mm. Um, just give him a bag. Seriously. <laughs> just give him a series of sample bags um, because you're absolutely right. Now, I, I, may be, I may be wrong here. And Alistair, and, and indeed Griff, you may be able to pick me up. Did they not also propose the idea that you could stop on the moon and inflate a large kind of waist like balloon around you using um, pressure from your from your backpack. And at that point, with this large balloon from your waist all the way around you filled with oxygen, you could then remove your helmet and eat. Now, I that is in, I believe, one of the original 1939 dated documents, the ones that we have the. Um, uh, that, that I took the mission badge from, um, the, 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 the original proposals. Now, I have not invented that. I have read that. Um, and I will check that when I get home. But I seem to recall they proposed the idea. There were several completely off the wall ideas. They were going to avoid lunar radiation on the, um, the spacecraft. They were going to erect a tent above it, weren't they? They were going to put a, like, a, like a sunproof um, uh, tent above it. Um, uh, to avoid you know being baked they had a small tent idea where they could erect a small sort of like radiation proof tent and get underneath it just for a bit of a rest if they could lie down on effectively a camp bed on the surface of the moon like you would if you were you know out hunting tigers in africa um and they proposed i think this idea of this this balloon type thing that you could then take your helmet off and eat on the moon now these are fantasy ideas. These are not sensible ideas, as we all can see. But to refer back to that first question, they're really talking about a 12 hour EVA on the surface of the moon. You are going to need, quite apart from anything else, you're going to need to take a wee and you're going to need to eat something. Uh, they have got no urine collecting device suggested at all. They've got no um, uh, provision for that whatsoever. They've got no provision for hydration on the moon, which is, I, th I believe that that was something that was critical. Um, I think the Apollo suit had a nose scratcher built into it as well, didn't it? Um, and it certainly had um, that thing that you could stick your nose into to do the Valsalva maneuver, the, um, the, the repressurization. So if you look on an Apollo helmet, it's got a small silicon thing shaped like the inside of your nose just here. And the idea was that you would lock your nostrils onto it and do that pressurization thing. Um, all of this was thought of for the Apollo flights. None of this was thought of by the guys, but it would have come to them as development went on. It would have come to them. Well, and I'm, re I'm reading the actual document that Griff sent me this morning, and it does mention the fact that they, uh, uh, they had a collapsible airlock compartment. That's the one at the front. Yeah. Um, I thought that was just for putting sandwiches through. Surely they can <laughs> actually eat them from the, the helmets big enough for them to eat and their, their hands are inside. It, 
Ah, uh, yeah, uh, yes, but um, but then, so your sandwich is, well, uh, here's the big thing. Can you get your hand up to your face from down below? I don't think you can. I don't, oh, I suppose, yeah, you suppose you could. You it's tell us, you tried it. Once the helmet's on, we, one would, yeah, it's going to be tight. You're going to be sort of eating like that, but yeah, you probably, yeah, you probably could have done. Yeah, you could have done, just yeah. about. Right, well, it's, it's fantastic. Examples through. The detail you've gone into is is incredible, and uh, Yuri, I'd I'd like to thank you for all that you've uh, you've done in the in the research on this one, uh, and gentlemen also, and ladies. It's it's been an absolute pleasure, and I have to say tonight's been absolutely wonderful as well because it shows that we've got some really intelligent people who are who are looking at really intelligent stuff and um, and asking really intelligent questions. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I mean well, that. We're doing, we're doing it in hindsight. So, um, you know, we, we've seen what the Apollo missions have done. We see now what SpaceX are doing. So I think we have had a, have the advantage of, uh, and also 25 years in the army taught me how to get my gloves off. <laughs> and, and also, you know, when we can see the the development of the of the Artemis suit and when that was unveiled, you look at it and you and you just see the lineage of yeah. that suit. I think NASA had, had really shot themselves in the foot by not developing suits. I think I was reading a whole article about this. They hadn't developed a spacesuit in the 90s. Um, they were relying on technology from the 80s. Mm -hmm. And this is their first suit development that's moved that forward. And it really has moved it forward. Rear entry, fixed helmet, huge mobility. And if you look at her boots that she was wearing, she's wearing hiking boots mm -hmm. because they didn't any longer want to give big, heavy suits. And that is that, and because they know that whilst the surface of the moon will require a lunar overshoot to avoid transfer of heat from the regolith, Mars doesn't. Mars, no. is, Mars is reasonably temperate, I believe, or it's reasonably cool, isn't it? I think it's... It, um, well, it's, it's minus 132, but... Um, oh, hang on. I thought, my, I thought bits of Mars were... were um, oh, in in sunshine, like, it does go up a bit, but it's still... Oh, right, okay. Cold. In that case, then that's quite cold, right? It's still yeah. pretty cold. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think we've got to close off now. I've had several thank yous already. I shall send the emails to you because uh, I think they... They thank you for doing all the work and also answering all the questions. Oh, bless so, you. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching tonight. It's been a real pleasure. Well, thank you. And thank you for taking time out from your filming of Flooring. Um, yeah. Now, what I'd like to, to finish off with is to thank everyone for, for joining us tonight and then remind people of two more lectures that are coming up. On the 12th of August, we've got Elementary Astrobiology by Michael Franks, and uh, that could be interesting. I've seen the slideshow already. And uh, then uh, on the 2nd of September, we have Ever Decreasing Circles, which is an introduction to the spacecraft mission orbits, which could be interesting because we look at various orbits being used now, and uh, some of them, of course, around the sun, and some of them around Earth, and other planets. And that's by John Davis who's uh, working up at the uh, the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. So those could be two interesting talks. And I've got another one being lined up for October. I can't tell you much about it at the moment, but it could be interesting. So thank you very much for coming on board tonight. Thank you very much also to Stephen for, for putting up with all our questions and the delay in getting started at the beginning. We'll get it right next time, I hope. And thanks also to Alan for setting it all up and getting it to work. Thank you and good night to all. Thank you, BIS. A very, very great pleasure meeting you all. Thank you. Okay, bye bye then.